So today we're going to talk about 16.2. Again, my name is Jason Barris. I'm a senior VP of DevTools at Infragistics. My email is jasonb at infragistics.com if you have any questions or follow-up. Uh, also with us uh, today is James Bender. He's on the line. He will be answering questions if you have them. And his email is <clears throat> jbender, B-E-N-D-E-R, at infragistics.com. Of course, feel free to email James. Um, and ask him whatever you'd like. Um, I know he'd love to hear from you. So what we're going to talk about today is Ultimate. What I'm going to do is very quickly look at what you get in Ultimate. A lot of customers, uh, most of the questions we get are about features that we already have in the product. Uh, and then, of course, we continue to add new features, which we're going to get to today, and we're going to talk about some, some cool demos. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is around Indigo Studio. I'll say one thing about Indigo Studio as um, we continue to add features and add value to this product. This year we added a really cool feature to Indigo Studio which was around unmoderated usability studies which you can do online through our cloud service indigodesigned.com. So if you are looking for a prototyping tool that goes beyond wireframing, this actually allows you to create completely interactive prototypes. Uh, test those prototypes, share them with your stakeholders, uh, do threaded commenting online about each state of the prototype. So, for example, when you have a screen and you click on a button, that screen changes to a new screen state, there might be comments you have on each step of that process. That's how the commenting works. And, of course, through usability studies, it removes the arguments about what a developer might think versus what the customer might think. So what we're trying to do here with all the software that we build um, and that you build is really get the voice of the customer and that understanding in it. You can really only do that by doing user research and user testing on your design. So if you're looking for a prototyping tool that goes, takes things to the next step, absolutely download Indigo Studio. We have a big launch of Indigo Studio on the 8th of November. So stay tuned for that. We'll also be doing another webinar around that in a few weeks, um, which will continue to push the limit on what we're doing around interactive prototyping and helping new um, design applications that your customers uh, really, really want. Next up, I just want to touch on what we're doing around a modern web. Sorry, my slide didn't go forward. Ignite UI is our modern web JavaScript framework. It basically does everything you need to deliver amazing experiences for your customers when it comes to the browser. So if you need to build a line of business app that has high volume, high performance data needs, Ignite UI is your solution. The nice thing around Ignite UI is all of the modern framework support that we include. So it's around Angular 1.5, 8, perfect. We have extensions for that. We have Angular 2 components. We have React extensions that we're just previewing now with uh, 16.2. And of course, we have really, really good MVC support uh, in Visual Studio. So no matter what you're doing, you want to build responsive web design apps. You want to build um, high performance apps. You want to have custom templating. You want to have all the rich features that you're used to on a desktop but all in the browser. Ignite UI is your, should be your toolkit of choice. So please check that out. We're going to look at some demos uh, in a little bit. Then, of course, modern desktop uh, infragistics uh, has its history rooted in super rich UI experiences for Windows Forms and then moving on to WPF. Uh, we still continue to invest in these tool sets. So if you are looking for that next generation modern experience in WPF, absolutely take a look at what we're doing uh, in infragistics Ultimate. It's in your toolkit. Everyone on the call probably has this already, and if you're not, and you need to build great experiences, check out because we are still investing in the modern desktop experience. And then moving on to mobility, we've been in mobility for uh, several years now. We started with our Nucleus product, which is a native Objective-C uh, set of tools for iOS. Uh, last year, we shipped our Android product. We also shipped our Xamarin Forms product, and we continue to invest heavily here. We are also doing some really slick stuff around mobility and Xamarin right now. Look for a very early Q1 release of some new exciting components and productivity tooling around Xamarin. So 
if you're doing mobility and most enterprises right now are just thinking about you know how are we going to get to mobile experiences I think the Microsoft acquisition of Xamarin was a major um, push or made a major push for the uh, developer space to actually look at Xamarin and remove the cost barrier to those tools uh, because it is open source and essentially free and allows you to have a you know, really good experience using your existing C-sharp skills to deliver a modern mobile to the metal experience with Xamarin. So we're pretty excited about Xamarin, but we're also uh, excited about what we're doing in iOS and Android. So if you do need to deliver native mobile and you need it now, we have that across pretty much every platform that you would um, you'd be looking to build on. And of course, this summer in July, we shipped UWP. So we were right there when Microsoft shipped the anniversary edition of Windows 10. We shipped our UWP product. And um, so if you're doing any UWP, though small amount of people, I think it'll grow over time. Uh, we have some really cool tools there that will help you build out great UX. And then, you know, a couple focus areas for us. One is around data visualization. We have really, really amazing UX when it comes to data visualization. So we're looking at <clears throat> cross-platform API. We've done a lot of work where <clears throat> we have our C-sharp core and we take advantage of that uh, capability and API across every platform that we ship. So JavaScript, iOS, Android. So if you're looking at building something in Objective-C for iOS, you're going to have a similar uh, slash same experience with the API and feature set that you would have used in WPF. So we really are optimized for giving you that leverage learning, but also optimized for really great experiences uh, in, in the browser, in the desktop, in the mobile device for lots of data rendered in real time. And I'm going to show a couple examples of that a little bit later. And then, of course, market-leading performance. We spend a lot of time in performance on high-volume, uh, high-volume, real-time data scenarios for charts and grids. And some of the big players in the industry choose us for um, their various needs. So we have a lot of good case studies online that we can talk about this. And if you're looking or you need something that does deliver, you know, millions of rows, virtualized data, load-on-demand data. Um, in charts or grids, you know, we're really, um, we're really known for that. We have a really good space right now, a really good footprint in financial services. They're probably the most demanding when it comes to data, um, but that, of course, spreads into other verticals as well. So this is, continues to be a focus for us. And in 16.2, we've actually added support, or not support, but some more samples to show off some of that capability. So with that, let's take a look at 16.2. What I'm going to do is go through some slides around the new features in 16.2. So we just teed this off with like, hey, this is what you get in Ultimate. Now let's take a look at what you get in 16.2, and then let's go into some demos um, on, on what we're doing there. So with WPF, uh, this, this platform, just like Windows Forms, is not going away. There, the enterprise is built on rich client today, and there's a lot of hype. The hype cycle around web is huge. But when you're thinking about a desktop experience where you need productivity for customers and, and your end users on things like data entry, real-time data, uh, you know, expressive visualizations, big grids, WPF really is where a lot of investment still happens. And believe it or not, Windows Forms too. But um, we do see a pickup in WPF over the last couple of years. So we're continuing to invest in WPF. I think if you look at our rich client story, we're kind of beyond that 80-20 rule. So if you say, well, 80% of customers need this set of features, um, we're there. With a focus on high volume, high performance experiences um, that also look really, really beautiful. If there is, um, if you're doing uh, something, uh, you know, a new app and you're like, hey, um, does Infragistics have this tool? There's a high degree of likelihood that it's, it's in the toolbox. We pretty much cover the gamut on, on what you get. And of course, we're still adding capabilities. So in 16.2, we continue to improve the styling story. We added something called the Royal Dark theme. That's that beautiful eye-popping screenshot that you see with the black background. This has its roots in the Metro theme, which we shipped several years ago. Um, of course, Metro was all the rage with Windows 8 and 8.1. 8 
and uh, that had sort of a touch experience to it, but what customers said was they want that same eye-popping um, dark feel, but although in a mouse-driven theme, so uh, they don't want you know bigger touch points, et cetera. So that's what Royal Dark is all about. It really looks beautiful. You apply this theme once, all of your uh, uh, controls in the application get it, and um, your application will just pop. Um, so it, it really, we really did a nice job there, our visual designers. Then we did a few features on the data presenter and the data grid. So the data presenter, we added something called cross-field filtering. Data grid, we have a field chooser select all. I'll show a demo of these in a sec. Um, we updated the property grid, so it's read right at runtime, um, and you have uh, data template selector support as part of that. So it just makes it more flexible to work with the property grid at runtime. The calendar, small feature, but um, useful is we added vertical scrolling, which means that the calendars used to just scroll horizontally. So if you want to go from month to month or year to year, now they scroll vertically as well. And then sort of a big thing is we've shipped NuGet packages with the product for a while. One of the issues around the trial experience was we had these NAG screens. So if you install the trial, thing would pop up. You know, you have 30 days left. It was kind of annoying. So in both WPF and Windows Forms, we removed those NAG screens and we just put down a watermark now that says trial version on, on the screen. So it, it actually is just a better experience for you when you're trialing it out. Windows Forms, like I said, you know, the rich client runs the enterprise still even today. Um, we're still investing in Windows Forms, albeit much at a much slower pace than what we used to in the past. And really it's just because we have so much stuff in there. So if you're doing Windows Forms and you're looking to see some new features or you would like us to do things, um, let me know what they are. I mean, we have user voice and we have folks voting up on user voice, but I'm not seeing like certain things like pop up to the top, like, oh, you know, uh, a thousand people voted on this particular feature and this is where the direction we have to go in Windows Forms. So what we're really doing in Windows Forms is we're just modernizing the experience overall. And that's sort of the goal is to continue to invest in things like the office, modern office UI experience, modern office themes, and then looking at individual controls and upgrading them if they need to uh, represent what would be expected in a more modern experience. So the first, uh, sort of the major effort for 16.2 is around the office nav bar with peak control. And uh, I'll do a demo of this, but it really just gives you this office 2013, office 2015 experience with navigation that you'd expect in Outlook and a nice peak control which could be templated to show anything. Another neat feature is the application zoom. Uh, what this allows you to do is actually scale the application view um, to any zoom level. So this takes whatever's rendered in GDI and just zooms it up, similar to how you would do pinch and zoom on a picture on your phone just to make it bigger. You can do the same thing now with your screen. Why is this cool? Well, we do already ship something called the Ultra Touch Provider. The Ultra Touch Provider essentially touch enables every touch point on the screen. So for example, if I drag the Ultra Touch Provider onto a form, I will get nine millimeter touch points around everything that I could interact with with the mouse. So now if I'm interacting with my finger, I don't fat finger it. It actually will give me a little bit of a buffer. What the application Zoom does is actually allows you to zoom the screen in to make everything bigger, including the fonts and what things like text rendered in the grid can actually zoom in to any size that you want. So you have control over how big or small something looks on the screen. So we basically scale uh, the entire, every UI element, everything that's rendered on the screen. Why is this neat? Because if you want to ship uh, a app on, let's say, a touch-enabled device or a smaller device, and um, you want the users to be able to see it better out in the field, uh, they need to see it bigger. So it can take something where you have a very data dense experience and then zoom it in or let the end user zoom it in um, as they need information. So this is kind of an interesting UI pattern. Uh, the third area was around the color chooser picker. Um, the color chooser color picker we shipped back in 2003, I believe, and it looked like it. So now we've modernized it. It looks and behaves as you would expect something in Visual Studio Color Picker, or Adobe Color Picker. So it's pretty nice, pretty high end. And of course, we did the work to remove the nav, NAG screens. Along with this, if you're using our test automation tools for IBM or HP, we also updated those to work with 16.2. So you can download 
um, the updated assemblies and, and do your scripting uh, and test automation for uh, IBM Rational Functional Tester and HP's test automation tools. So still a lot of effort there on the testing side and of course a lot of effort still in Windows Forms. Uh, and we're going to continue to invest in Windows Forms. So moving forward in 17.1, you'll see more data visualization components. We're working on some barcodes and some new things there uh, that are pretty exciting that will further continue to modernize uh, what you deliver in the Windows Form space. For Ignite UI, lots of work here in Ignite UI. Again, this is our modern uh, web toolkit that will help you pretty much deliver any experience on any modern platform with beautiful styling and with super high performance. So the grid itself, we did a bunch of improvements around grouping, um, column summary headers, collapsible groups. I'll kind of go into some demos of this. Uh, we also have a really cool feature around multi-row layout. Well, we, we included editing in that now, so you can do editing within a multi-row layout. Uh, we added a virtual scroll bar. Um, which is sort of gives you this behavior like you would get in a phone where the scroll bar only appears when you're interacting with the uh, control and then when you move off of the control the scroll bar disappears so it's actually a pretty nice experience there um, the zoom bar got some extensibility features so the zoom bar is pretty cool it allows you to zoom in and out of time periods in a data visualization uh, the background is a you know could be another chart it's like the experience you get in a financial chart um, what we did here was we made it so you could attach multiple visualizations to the zoom bar, but also an extensibility object which would allow you to attach a third party visualization to the zoom bar. So if you're using, let's say, um, let's say you have a, uh, a dashboard that's using uh, Infragistics chart and then some other chart that maybe we don't support, which I don't know what chart that would be, but you can attach the zoom bar to that third party chart as well as our chart so you have a, a, a synchronous experience across zooming in and out of time periods. So anyway, a pretty cool feature. IG Combo, we just impressed, or impressed, we just um, added some features around suppressing the software keyboard on drop down button click, which is just a nice UX enhancement. Uh, we continue to ensure that we are up to snuff on MVC6, so we added tag helpers or improved our tag helper experience. And then we added a live data sample, which is one of the things I talked about earlier, which I will do a quick demo of uh, when we get to the demos. Now, some big news here for Ignite UI is we're actually open sourcing uh, the core components. So what this means is that you know 40 plus controls now in Ignite UI are actually open sourced. What we didn't open source was the grids and the charts. But all of the other controls in Ignite UI are open source. Now, as a customer, all of Ignite UI is completely supported by, by your subscription. So you don't have to worry about Ignite UI not getting um, support on the open source uh, products. Everything is fully supported. Uh, but what we're trying to do here is give ourselves um, the ability to have a more open process with the community around new features and new capabilities in the product, as well as you know you are you can participate in in a little closer in the direction of what we're doing with Ignite UI. And uh, so far, since we did open source this, we've got a ton of really positive feedback and um, a lot of stars on the repository and, and, and folks are getting involved. Another neat thing here uh, as far as open source, besides, uh, well, let me just talk about Angular 2 and, and the next one, uh, React. So, of course, Angular, our Angular components were always open source. Uh, we've done the same with our Angular 2 components. So if you are doing Angular 2 uh, and you need to um, use or you want to use Ignite UI, just go to GitHub, grab our extensions, and like magic, everything just works. Uh, full two-way data binding support, uh, real high performance. Obviously, Angular 2 is sort of on the um, big on the hype cycle, low on the adoption curve right now, but over time um, that will change. Of course, we still have our Angular 1.5 extensions uh, on GitHub. Those are fully supported as well through your subscription. So no matter which version of Angular you're using, we have you covered. And the same goes with React. We actually have um, React extensions. So I can, uh, if you're doing a React application and you want to 
have a high volume, high performance data chart or a really slick grid with all kinds of features like grouping, sorting, merging, etc., um, you can go for it. Along with all of this, uh, especially the Angular, you get TypeScript support. So we have full TypeScript support across all of the components uh, in Visual Studio, in Visual Studio Code, uh, so you can go to town there. And of course, that includes you know, anything that you're doing in jQuery, anything that you're doing with the Infragistics components, anything you're doing with Angular. So we really work hard there to ensure that we've got the TypeScript support across the board. I mean, that's basically the, the language uh, that we're using here for um, Angular. So the, um, the other thing I wanted to mention as far as uh, open source is our documentation. So with 16.2, we've actually open sourced all of our docs. Uh, so it's not just the Ignite UI docs, it's the WPF docs, it's the Windows Forms docs. It's basically everything that we ship as far as documentation is now up on GitHub. So if you want to contribute, fix, add, comment, etc., please go for it. Docs are always that one area where no matter how good you think your docs are, most people will think your docs are no good. So we would love to get your feedback more and make that more of an open process on how we are um, looking at docs in the market. And then the last thing I'll talk about as far as open source is a brand new set of UI controls that we're shipping with 16.2. So this is pretty exciting. We are shipping something called Ignite UI JS blocks. And these are mobile Angular 2 components and they are open source. So these will really enable you to deliver a next generation mobile progressive web experience with Angular 2. We have a bunch of components that are shipping with this today. We're going to continue to add components to this over the next several releases. But what you can do with this component set is actually build out slick mobile apps that can scale from the desktop browser all the way down to a phone. Of course, that's the um, whole Google story around the progressive web experience, progressive web apps, and we're sort of following right along with that. Fully support uh, material theme with this. So as the material theme improves, we're just passing through that experience right to you. So it's a pretty exciting new set of controls. We are um, real happy to finally ship these. We've been working on them for about six months, and they're going to continue to get better. And I'll kind of go into the GitHub a repo here and show you what they look like and um, show you how to get to all this open source stuff. And then finally with charting, actually not finally, we're almost there, but uh, last slide or two here. Uh, we've done a ton of work in 16.2 with charting. What we've really tried to do here is take the existing data chart and simplify the entire API and all the defaults. So we've created a new abstraction off of that called the category chart. So the category chart includes your line charts, your column charts, your by char pie charts, your area charts, and that API now can literally get boiled down to just setting a data source and then the chart just renders. So we have this intermediate data layer that's part of the charting JavaScript or the chart charting assembly, and it allows, it gives us the ability to inspect your data and then render the most appropriate chart type. It's really slick, it's really modern, it takes all of the verbose syntax that we had around setting up a series, setting up an axis out of the chart. Along with that, we've actually more than doubled the rendering performance in high DPI scenarios. So for example, if you're using an iPad Pro, uh, if you're using, like I'm using a Dell uh, XPS 13, it's a couple years old, but it's got like a 2900 by 2100 screen resolution, something ridiculous. Uh, that new Microsoft Surface Studio, which has like, I don't know, 4 million more colors than a 4K TV. I don't even know. The number was extreme. But something like that, what ends up happening just from a, a, a component level is that we actually have to write the code to ensure that everything we render looks perfectly crisp and clear in a high DPI scenario. So what we did prior to 16.2 was we did not render certain areas of the chart in high DPI, and that was really for performance reasons. So we revisited that, and now the chart in a high DPI scenario can go as high as almost 160, 170 frames per second. So you're talking about 
better than real-time experience if, there, if there's such a thing um, on a mobile device with this data visualization component. So it's really exciting what we've done with the charting. We've also updated the default look and feel, the default styles. Uh, we also have a new control called the shape chart. The shape chart's really slick. It allows you to bind to any Esri shape file. Could be a floor plan, it could be an airline seating chart, it could be anything, and then plot data over that, then put scatter data or heat data over that, so it's really slick. Um, or just use it as, as it is. And then we also improved the pie chart. So the pie chart now has uh, full MVVM support, and part of that was doing um, uh, selection mode. So manual, multiple, single, that all kind of comes through um, with it. And along with these chart types, so if you think about what we have in, in charting, um, it's basically everything from line, bar, column, um, scatter plots, um, line plots. You know, a scatter plot, is, it could be a bunch of dots on the screen connected by lines. Um, there's a dot chart. There is radar charts. You know, like wind rows is a type of chart, but we have um, <clears throat> polar charts that represent the same visualizations. We have the 3D surface chart. We have uh, over 60 chart types, and that with those chart types, you can combine them together so you can overlay lines over column charts. But we also support trend lines, so we have, um, I don't know, six or eight different trend lines. We have about 15 different financial indicators. So with charting, uh, we have a super robust toolkit that basically can render any type of visualization that you need. So in the questions, I saw a couple folks asking about you know, dot charts, line charts, bar charts. Yes, we support all of those. Um, and I will show you where to find those in the sample browser. Um, and then finally, I'll just go quickly go through this slide. November 8th, <laughs> keep an eye on your email and your inbox. We got uh, slick things coming with Indigo Studio around this new feature called group workspaces uh, slash team spaces. So um, that's all I'll say for now. Um, but keep an eye out uh, for the next webinar or the next Sizzle video around Indigo Studio because we are doing some slick, slick innovation there um, on the prototyping usability testing front. And then finally, Report Plus Embedded. This shipped in the middle of this year. Every Ultimate and Pro customer gets the Report Plus uh, uh, set of components. And so, you know, if you want to go to the, um, use the mobile app for your iOS app. If you want to embed uh, WPF reporting into your existing app, you can do that. There's a different licensing model for how we distribute Report Plus, so make sure you contact sales about that. But anyway, Report Plus is the most modern way to deliver beautiful dashboards and visualizations without writing any code. I mean, these are, we have a WYSIWYG chart designer Basically, you connect into one of our any 30 or so data sources, uh, and you can just drag and drop, build out charts, build out dashboards, and then embed those dashboards into your application. So we've done some amazing work here with Report Plus. I'm pretty excited about it, and um, I think if you take a look at it, you'll be pretty excited about it too. So with that, let's start looking at some demos. So let us first start with WPF. Um, that's Windows Forms. So let me open up my WPF sample browser. All right, so WPF here, um, and, and, and just a little side note, if you are, uh, you don't know where to go to get all this stuff, just go to infragistics.com. And when you're at infragistics.com, <laughs> there's a couple ways to download the samples. The easiest way is you just click on my account here. And then you get your login screen, and I'm going to go ahead and type in my um, email and my passwords. Go ahead and keep me signed in. And once I log in, you have a list here of all of the products that you own in My Keys and Downloads. So just go ahead and select Infragistics Ultimate 2016 Volume 2, and then it lists all the stuff that you get with that. So if you want to download just Ignite, if you want to download Android, if you want to download um, all the products or selectively, just download the ultimate platform installer. And what that will do is it brings up this dialog that it lets you just select what you want, um, and then you can go ahead and uh, just install it. 
So let's take a look here at a couple samples. So the category chart is sort of what I mentioned, and this is the new um, chart that we ship, the new um, abstraction off of the ZAM data chart. And again, I think the first thing that you'll notice is the eye-popping color. So we did a lot of work here to ensure that we have some really, really nice default colors. Now this doesn't mean that you have to only use these colors if you are um, against like really vibrant um, purples and oranges and, and greens, that's okay. We have a bunch of different themes that you can use. So you can simply apply one of our themes or use your own themes, it's no big deal. But as I cycle through these charts, I just picked a little picker here, um, you can see the different types of visualizations that we have. There's like a, a couple second lag on the display here over the um, over the life size or the, uh, the go to meeting here. But anyway, you get the idea that you can have different types of plot, plot, plots with this category chart um, and they look really, really nice. Now the nice thing is if I go to the XAML and I look at what it actually took to bind to this chart, um, you'll actually see here that the XAML to bind to the chart is as minimal as possible. And in fact, I can, let me see if I can copy that, make it actually bigger, put it in Notepad. I think that'll work. Yeah, here we go. So I'll make it bigger. It was kind of hard to see um, on the screen there. But take a look at this. If I simply just look at what I need to bind the chart, I've got here chart type, scroll this over, and the chart type's just being selected by the combo box, but essentially I set the name, I set the item source, and that's all I need to do. I don't need to actually tell it what kind of chart type to render. All I need to do is set the item source um, and give it a name, and the chart will actually look at the data and determine the best route to plot the data. Now, in these samples, the reason that we are saying um, do a chart type is because we have this combo box, so we're just trying to cycle through. But in, I mean, in almost all of your scenarios, if you just bind a data source to the chart, it will render appropriately. And it's the same exact thing um, in Ignite UI. So here, uh, since you know everything that we're doing is um, cross-platform, I have the same story here. So here's a chart that we plotted, and you can see what we're doing here as far as um, what we are actually plotting. So if I make this a little bit bigger, you can read it. I'm saying, uh, give me a category chart and just bind it to this data, and this is the data that's sitting up here. And then, of course, right here I've got the plot that um, I'm rendering. So it is pretty amazing um, you know, what you can actually uh, do with this chart with literally no code. Now compare this to what we used to have to do um, on the charts and you'll see that you know yeah there was a lot of extra stuff that you know we actually had to uh, a lot of extra JavaScript or a lot of extra code um, for what we had to, to write. So here if I go back to like an old fiddle that I have which is kind of um, old I just want to demonstrate what, what this used to look like. So I would have to set up some properties on the data chart instead of data source. Then I would have to set up the axes. So that was another eight or 10 lines of JavaScript or XAML. And then I had to set up a series, which was again another 12 or 15 lines of XAML. Um, and then I would have to set up some features on it. And then if I wanted brushes, I had to set up the brushes. So you could see that, yeah, this got to be, it was a, a fairly verbose API. Well, no more. So now what you get is something that's super optimized, super simple, a couple lines, or not even a couple lines, a couple property settings, and you're going to get the same exact output that you did before. So we really want to stress that with 16.2, charting becomes so much better. Not only did we improve the API, we improved the uh, default styles, we improved the default property settings, and we more than doubled the rendering performance in these high DPI scenarios. So it's pretty amazing what we've done in charting across the board, and we will continue to push the limits on what we can do in data visualization. This is something that is 
super important to us. We use our data visualization components. Um, obviously, as part of the DevTools product, we use them in Report Plus. Um, you guys are building BI products and doing all kinds of dashboarding and charting with them. So I think um, you know, you'll be happy with the results of what we've done here. Now let's take a look at some of the other features in the grid that we shipped. I'm going to click the glyph up here in the header on the far left. And you'll see I've got a couple options that show up. We've got the field chooser here. This is um, one of those customer delighters. We've got the select all and deselect all options. So here I can show or hide all of the columns. The reason this is cool is because when you have a lot of fields, um, you know, it's much easier maybe to deselect all and just select a couple options than select, uh, you know, 10 or 12 fields. The other thing is this all can be persisted. Um, and of course, it falls through into all of the hierarchy that you may have um, with the data source. So extremely useful. Second area is around cross-field record filters. Oops. Sorry. Let me bring this uh, uh, dialog up. So here what you can do is actually add and group multiple conditions on cross-field filtering. So you'll notice that here I've got a blue bar when I click the, the, the little bar here. And this changes to an AND operator or an OR operator. So all of this ends up being very interactive within the grid. And I can add as many conditions as I want um, based on field type. So, um, and actually just to make it easier, what I'll do is let me jump back to, um, are you sure? Yes, I'm positive. Let me just jump back to the sample <laughs> and bring up one that's pre-populated so um, you get a better idea. Uh, so here I've got a big, uh, gray colored bar, which is an AND, and then I've got the blue one, which is my ORing, and down here I can say country equals UK or country equals USA, and the contact name starts with A. So I'm actually grouping these, and I can clear groups, I can add additional groups, but the idea behind this feature is we have a customer that does, uh, they basically have the market for 911 in, in the US. So 911 is if you have an emergency, you dial 911 and it routes you to a call center and then an ambulance shows up at your house or the police show up at your house or whatever. Well, what they needed was the ability to do a more robust filter on anding and oring across the grid and then group those and and ors. So we built that into the grid. Um, we built an API around it, then we, we updated the uh, filtering dialog to support all of that now. So if you're doing any robust filtering where you want to add uh, either increase rows in the grid or decrease rows in the grid based on handing and oring groups. Um, that's what this is all about. And then finally on the grid, what I'll show off real quick, I will bring up uh, the theming example here. And just so you can see on the theme, we do have a bunch of different themes, but we also have the brand new Royal Dark theme. So here I've got a nice purple foreground, black background. Um, and we have a few variations. We have a royal theme. Um, we have a royal strong theme. Um, but royal dark is the new one. And this is the one. We're getting a lot of love already from customers who really, really like the royal dark theme. Um, and, and they're pretty excited about it. Uh, pie chart, pretty cool here. Just if you're looking to ensure that you've got selection for MVVM in this interactive sample, you can see that I do have a selected item property. And if I change my mode to multiple selection, I get a bunch of selected items. So this just makes your app dev a lot easier. And of course, I mentioned the XAM property grid earlier. And there's a few other enhancements across the board uh, in WPF. But in the sample browser, uh, everything is sort of highlighted by new, uh, a little new flag. So I just want to keep moving along. We don't have much time left. Uh, let's jump over to our Windows form samples. And I just want to highlight here um, some of the work we did around the color palette, the office nav bar with peak control, and then the zoom panel. So first I'll just launch the color palette example to give you an idea of what this looks like. So here you've got um, a component that can be used separately off the screen, or you can use it in a picker experience. So here um, you can actually create custom colors, um, you can drag, you have a uh, the little 
dot tool where you can go and pick another color and that'll actually be reflected back. You get the RGB as well as the alpha levels. And of course, as with all of Infragistics controls, you just have a ton of customization. So each one of these elements can be shown or hidden on the screen. Um, and uh, it's just a really rich modern experience for um, doing color. Office nav bar with peak. This is really slick. This can add instant modernization to your app if you start adding things like the nav bar that you expect in Office on the bottom, but also then this area which comes in a nice tool tip that can be templated and be interactive um, it is really slick. So this is called the peak tool. So as you hover over, you actually get things that you can click and interact with, etc. And then of course you've got all of the style options. So the different styles for Office, um, Visual Studio, of course Vista isn't that popular anymore, but at the end of the day, the Office 2013 style is um, pretty nice. Different alignments, different orientation, so I can do a horizontal um, or a vertical um, orientation, and when I do that, my peak just shows up a little bit differently, which is really nice. Uh, and then, of course, you have all the things about text placement, um, how the labels rotate, overflow, and then how many items you want on the nav bar, because if you have an overflow, you can just click your uh, little overflow button and you can see additional options. So if I bust this down to two and I click it, you can see that monthly just shows up down here um, in, my, in my selector and then monthly can show up. So anyway, this works just like you would expect Office to work. And like the color picker, like the features we added in 16.1 and 15.2, it's just continuing to help modernize that experience that you get in Windows Forms. And then as I use the application zoom bar here, we are actually zooming in to um, this application. And I can do things like, you know, use my mouse so I can pan um, with the mouse. Control drag here. And I'll zoom in and out that way. I can control zooming with my mouse wheel. Um, and of course, I'm trying to, I don't have a mouse wheel on my, um, my laptop here, but anyway, you get the idea. Uh, so what this helps you do is really have that really uh, nice scalable experience for any type of application that you're writing in Windows Forms on any type of device. And we expect that um, since this was really driven by feature requests and customers, you might have additional uh, feedback on what this thing actually does once you start playing with it. So definitely let us know via user voice or support or my email on, on how you're using the Zoom um, the application Zoom bar, or the Zoom panel. All right, so with that, we've talked about Windows Forms, we've talked about WPF, we've touched a little bit on charting. Let's take a look at Ignite UI real quick. So this is my Ignite UI sample browser. You can get this just right at IgniteUI.com. This is the one that's installed locally. <laughs> one of the nice things we've done here with this release is not only do you have this button here that says New and Updated, and it will filter out all the samples and it'll just show you what is a new sample or an updated sample. You also have this OSS uh, button. So if I click OSS now, it'll list out all of the things that I get in the open source version of Ignite UI. And if you want to very quickly find the Ignite UI open source, you can just go to Google and type in Ignite UI GitHub and you're going to find a bunch of search results, but the first one that comes up is IgniteUI-GitHub, which is simply github.com forward slash IgniteUI, and here we have all of the stuff that you get in open source. So the first thing is JS blocks. So if I click op open JS blocks, and I look here, here's my repo with all the stuff that you get with it and kind of how to get started. Um, coding guidelines, NPM packages. If I look at the source, this will give you an idea of all the stuff that we're shipping. So here you've got avatar, badge, button, carousel, checkbox, icon, input, label, layout, list, modal, nav bar, nav drawer, radio, switch, tab bar, themes. So a ton of stuff that's in there today. We're going to continue to improve this uh, over time and add more capabilities to uh, JS blocks. Like I said, we're pretty excited about it. Here's our Angular 2 components all here on GitHub. 
So I click into source, and I can see there's my TypeScript files, TypeScript definitions, all the stuff that I need to uh, do Angular 2 with TypeScript, and it tells me um, the custom tags that I get or that I have for my data bound controls and pretty much everything that's available, and then some component definitions. Now the nice thing is for this particular uh, set of components as well as our Angular 158, uh, you can run the sample. So I downloaded uh, a version and I'm running these locally um, through Node and NPM and we have interactive samples which are showing the code so you can actually get started with Angular right away, see how the component definitions work um, use those in your application. So I want to use the combo box. I can just click IG combo and like magic I see a working combo box and sort of how um, this should uh, this should happen here. So if I have tofu here and I'll just say you know Jason tofu and I go back. Um, we have Jason tofu in my drop down right away because this is of course angular and it's doing two way data binding on the client. So it's a beautiful experience that lets you really modernize with these modern platforms. And of course we have the same thing for um, Angular 158 uh, and I also started my JS block samples here so I've got all of my um, JS blocks as well. So I have my carousel samples, I've got my navigation drawer sample which is pretty slick. Um, I've got my nav bar, my list, my inputs, et cetera. Um, so these are all pretty nice components. We, we have some nice features. So you'll see username is sort of the watermark here. Once I click into it, it sort of animates out. And you'll see I got my two-way data binding. Um, the, the way that this component set works is really, really nice. It's really modern, follows the material theme, um, and you can build out really nice experiences with um, JS blocks. So on GitHub, um, sort of my message is go to Ignite UI, uh, github.com forces Ignite UI, check out all the stuff that we have. For Ignite UI specifically, on its main page, there's a nice graph which shows what's open source and then what is fully supported. So you'll just see that in the left column, there's some random red X's, and those random red X's are the things that are not open source. Everything else is open source. But the other thing I want you to see here is that everything is supported. So as a customer, all of this stuff is supported. You don't have to worry about not getting support. All right, so let's take a look at uh, back to some of these samples. There's a few that I want to highlight. The first one is a new sample we added called Binding Real-Time Data. So let me scroll up here. And what you'll see, and it comes across a little bit um, uh, strange when you look at the uh, this over the WebEx because it's a little bit slower. But what's happening is that rows are updating and being highlighted and different charts, uh, the spark lines in the left-hand column are actually getting updated uh, as well. So you actually have a, a good example here of using signal R and the grid. Of course, all the source code is down here. You can use JS Fiddle to go edit it, et cetera, but you end up with a nice, um, a nice way to see the features and learn the features. I mentioned uh, inline editing. So this is really cool. So check this out. So you'll see here across the top, I've got a multi-column um, header. So it's a fairly complex layout. I've got my Add New button. Uh, so I can click that to get an Add New Row, or I can just go into a row and you'll notice that I'm tabbing through each field in a tab stop way. So I get this really slick experience on doing editing in a multi-column, multi-row layout, which is really, really rich. So imagine the potential here. You can really craft this any way you want to display the data any way you want as well as giving a rich editing experience. Um, and then furthermore, when we talk about these complex header scenarios, if I take a look at these column groupings, we've added this collapse expand glyph up here on the top. So I can actually expand this entire column group, or I can collapse the entire column group. 
But the nice thing about this is if I jump over to address here, you'll notice I got address, city, postal code, phone number, etc. Now, address is one column, city is another column. I'm going to collapse address, and we've actually combined this into a new template. So now we have address and city in a single column. So you have the ability to not only collapse a column group, but retemplate the collapsed column group. If I look here at the code, it's pretty simple. Um, if I bring this up a little bit bigger, you can see that we are simply setting a new template based on the fact that the parent is expanded or collapsed. So you have the ability to say in a collapsed mode or an expanded mode, show different data in the cell, which is really, really sweet. So the sky's the limit here on really what you can do with this grid. Another nice sample we added, again, around performance. This is the grid, and it is about how much data can I jam into this grid at once. So I'm going to just jump up my slider here to 20,000 rows. I'm going to jack this up to 20 columns. I'm going to enable filtering. And I've got continuous virtualization. I'll rebuy the grid. So this is going off to a server somewhere in Philly. Um, and it's bringing back 20,000 rows of data down here. And now it's just got you got to wait for it to come up on your WebEx. It's on my screen here. But what's happening is I am literally um, doing performance metrics on how fast this data. I don't know why it's not showing up on this WebEx. Uh, oh, there it goes. That was there's a bigger delay than I thought on the WebEx. But anyway, so here's my grid, and here's the beautiful thing. As I scroll, you'll notice that underneath the grid, this is showing me how much time it's taking to rebind the data within this grid. So because it's virtualized, we're just putting putting data into the existing DOM. So my horizontal and vertical scrolling. If you run this yourself. Um, on your own uh, computer, it's super fast. Over the WebEx, it's a little bit uh, sluggish. But the idea is this really does demonstrate really great real-time um, high-performance data. And along with that, I always like to demonstrate the chart example. So here, I've got my data chart. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to jack this up to 1 million rows. And I'm going to hit refresh. And you see how fast that bound to the grid? And now I'm going to zoom in, but I'm also going to touch. So I'm actually using my fingers to touch the screen now. And, um, and Jeff can vouch for me here. It's like an instant um, responsiveness on this touch experience. So it's actually super, super slick, really, really nice. But the other nice feature here is when we talk about binding real-time data, now the frames per second on this are absolutely going to be slower because it's coming across. Uh, WebEx, but the idea is this is going really, really fast, and even at its slowest, 50 frames per second, I am getting a really super responsive, beautiful, seamless display. As I zoom in, you can start to see this thing is just chunking across the screen. And by the way, this is perfectly smooth on my screen. On the <laughs> WebEx, it looks a little bit choppy, but um, it does not do it justice, exactly. Uh, but you can also see here, as I look down on my left-hand uh, menu, we've got a bunch of new samples, a bunch of different things uh, that we've done at Ignite UI. So I just recommend you go to igniteui.com and you grab those samples and check that out because uh, I'm pretty much out of time here. i got a couple more slides that I want to show just to highlight um, a few things that we offer online. Go grab the showcase samples. We have samples that cover basically every platform and every scenario. Um, go and grab our case studies. Um, you can learn how other people are using our products. Some of these are really, really nice and polished. I really like our case studies. And they will help you sell infragistics um, into uh, uh, your enterprise. And then really just go get Ignite UI. Uh, today.
download it at infragistics.com forward slash ultimate. Along with that, you get your Report Plus Embedded SDK. Keep an eye out next week um, for the updates on Indigo Studio, November 8th. Big launch of an Indigo Studio. Um, so with that, I just recommend, you know, go take a look at more of the samples. I couldn't get through everything today um, because there are a ton of new samples. But again, feel free to email me at jasonb at infragistics.com or jbender at infragistics.com.